we're going to talk about um, reparations, and in particular, uh, you all, uh, you and your predecessor, um, first city in America. That's right. I think at this time we are the only city that has actually given out uh, reparations as part of a race-based program to repair the harm that we uh, perpetrated to our shame. <clears throat> And you have a particular focus on housing. Uh, why? How'd you end up there? I know you had a had a commission or right. organization take a look at it, and in particular, I also want you to focus on how you're funding it. Right. So l let me back up for a minute, if you don't mind, because mm -hmm. there's a lot of context here. Sure. You know, obviously, when people hear the word reparations, their minds naturally go to the question of slavery, uh, which is, you know, obviously a foundational question for this country, we as a small town in the Midwest don't feel that we have the capacity or tools to repair the harm done by that fundamental crime in this country's history. But to our shame, we have done plenty on our own, not as being party to uh, chattel slavery, but uh, specifically around the question of housing segregation. And so there is actually a, a lot of research done locally into the role that the city government itself deliberately and knowingly played in enforcing segregation, uh, segregation in housing, segregation in access to public amenities, mm -hmm. uh, and there's plenty that we did. Okay. And we have today still, I would say, a very alarmingly segregated city, and that segregation winds up uh, being felt among other things in the context of property value and therefore generational wealth. And so um, we, unfortunately, as a city, as a corporate body, deliberately and knowingly enacted policies to segregate our community that today still are felt in terms of the massive rape, white black uh, wealth gap that exists in our city. So are we talking about redlining? Are we talking about mortgage discrimination? Are we talking about zoning? Well, so the city itself wasn't really the main actor behind redlining, but through our zoning code, through our willingness to enforce not only what the federal government and the financial institutions were doing with redlining, but also what local homeowner associations and realtor groups were doing, mm -hmm. uh, and then through our allocation of public resources, mm -hmm. um, we were really an important, an important part of that segregation machine. And so we feel that we owe a debt. Mm -hmm. And because that debt is so closely tied to the role that our housing policies played, we've begun the process of repaying it through a housing program. And how are you paying for it? Uh, well, initially, uh, as this was first being discussed, the state legalized the recreational use of cannabis. And because of the role that race has played in the drug war and because of the, you know, at a minimum in practice, and many would argue in intent, uh, racist uh, components of the way the cannabis laws were uh, enforced, we felt that here's a, there's a new revenue stream coming into municipal government, and it's coming in because of a policy change that's trying to reverse this history, and so what better uh, way to put it to use than to fund the reparations program? So the, in the first act the city uh, council took was to commit the first $10 million that will come in through the sales tax on recreational cannabis to the reparations fund. Now. We turn out to be uh, worse drug dealers than we anticipated, uh, and so the rate of That's... receipt of cannabis tax revenue has been very slow, uh, and it's really hampered our ability to do this uh, program at the rate that we think is critical, and so we've recently added another revenue stream, which is a portion of the real estate transfer tax, goes mm. into the, re the reparations fund as well. Okay. So.